you know, I thought it'd be fun to have this conversation because we're all sort of, I think, united by an interest in or maybe an appreciation of Nietzsche and then the practical applications that we, uh, we can all derive in our individual lives. Um, you know, Brad, obviously, you're, you're legendary in my world, uh, and uh, not just are you a fellow MIT alum, but, um, you know, you sort of pioneered a way of doing VC uh, uh, from way back when, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it, I'm, ex I'm super excited for this conversation. And then, Father Francisco, um, you know, you, you and I go back a long way, um, and I thought of you uh, because you were the one who introduced me to Nietzsche, so, so uh, I thought it'd be fun sort of twist to this conversation. You know, Brad and I can chit chat all we want about BC, but having someone who actually knows their stuff uh, is uh, on the philosophy side, uh, I thought it'd be fun to kind of uh, introduce here. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe you can start us off and, and introduce yourself. And then, and then I'd love for Brad to take it from there and chat a little bit about the book that that's come out and sort of the inspiration and, and we can go from there. Well, thank you very much, Krishna. Firstly, let me say that I'm, um, I'm a little bit abashed at my presence in this conversation, uh, partly because uh, I feel that I might possibly be here under false pretenses. Um, I did indeed introduce Krishna to Nietzsche, um, but all those years ago, I thought I was inoculating him. Little did I know that he'd become uh, such a fan. So, um, on that score, I, I have to say that um, my, my interest in Nietzsche by and large has been, at least pedagogically, to turn the kind of scrutiny that he uh, encourages us to adopt, um, not only on the body of his own work, but I'd say generally on the, the so-called um, masters of suspicion. It's a, it's a term that Paul Ricoeur um, uh, initiated. And, and I think that that's where we get the idea that there is a kind of hermeneutics of suspicion at work in um, the analysis offered by figures like Freud, Marx, and of course, Nietzsche. So part of my strategy all these many years, and, and it appears to have failed with regard to Krishna, has been to, to get um, my students to apply that same hermeneutics of suspicion in the opposite direction. So if you're comfortable with me being part of this conversation under, under those circumstances, I guess I'm, Certainly, yeah, I guess I'm okay. We want, we, want, uh, we want to chat about, um, you know, I mean, I think Nietzsche would appreciate that. So, so, and, and some of the questions that I think we have planned for this conversation, you know, I, I'd love to get your perspective on Brad. It's just like really the theme that I'd love to drive toward today is, how you know how relevant is Nietzsche going forward? We all know that he's he's remarkably relevant when we read him today, and we you know when I when I read him, it, it feels like it, he could be talking about everything we deal with on a day to day basis. Um, I'd love Brad you to just first introduce yourself and kind of where you came up with this concept um, and, and why why Nietzsche of all the masters uh, you know do you think uh, is most applicable to entrepreneurs? But really projecting out 10, 20 years in this age of machines and humans, um, why do we think that Nietzsche will remain relevant, inspiring, uh, and so on and so forth? Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a partner at a venture firm called Foundry Group. I'm also co-founder uh, of Techstars. Uh, I've been an investor now uh, for a long time, uh, which surprises me when I think about it. Uh, going back to the mid nineties. And prior to that, I was an entrepreneur. And with my first business partner, uh, a guy named Dave Jilk, uh, I've been, we've been best friends for now 38 years, which is a little, again, a little hard to sort of ponder. Uh, if you said I ha had a best friend for 38 years, I'd say, am I 38? Like, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like that kind of time passing. Um, but, you know, I accept it. And Dave and I, who ran a business from 1987 to 1993, sold it to a public company, have done a bunch of projects since. And a number of years ago, um, we sort of randomly stumbled together upon 
doing this project. And where it came from was uh, Dave, Dave had semi-retired. And one of the things he did was he went very, very deep on individual philosophers. And he was going through um, a phase where he was reading uh, Nietzsche in the original, not the original German, but the translations. And uh, one of the things we really enjoy doing a lot as friends is we'd spend weekends together with our wives and you know they might go for a hike or they might go skiing, Dave and his wife and Amy and I would lay around and read. And then when they get back, we'd all read. So there's a lot of reading. And during one of these uh, weekends, Dave sort of tossed out one of Nietzsche's quotes and said to me randomly, does that sound like entrepreneurship to you? And he remembers me not even looking up from my book and just sort of saying, mm-hmm, and continuing to read. But that started this sort of bouncing Nietzsche quotes or aphorisms around that just, as that happened over a couple of years, a lot of them just rang true, not as answers to activities in entrepreneurship, but as um, provocative statements for then exploring different aspects of entrepreneurship. And including many of the provocative statements that I would say challenged, not even conventional wisdom, but things that had become trendy and things that everybody was saying sort of as a matter of course without thinking about it. And that led us to then write this book where our goal with this book was not uh, to give people answers, but to force deeper thought around specific questions of leadership, of entrepreneurship, of self-reflection in the context of entrepreneurship. Now, the other motivation for the book is both Dave and I have been very influenced by uh, Stoicism and a friend, uh, Ryan Holiday, has written some amazing books uh, sort of bringing you know, Stoicism and some of the classics to sort of contemporary four with a, a lens on entrepreneurship, but broadly writ and making them very accessible. Um, however, a lot of the stoicism is more, you should do this. If you wanna have a certain kind of life, this is a way to handle what's going on. This is a way to respond to things. This is a way to comport yourself. And with Nietzsche, when we dug into it, we didn't get that from Nietzsche. We got something very different, which is, here's a thing to think about, ponder it. And so we did a lot of that sort of in the context of this book. Those were the, really the motive, motive forces for us, this working together on a long arc project that stimulated us both around thinking around entrepreneurship. And then, you know, if, if we're, you know, one one hundredth as good as Ryan has been uh, at bringing Nietzsche sort of into the language of entrepreneurship in a positive way, in, in a way that provokes people to think, um, then we'll have done something good with this book. Yeah, that, that's that's fascinating um, because yeah, I, I I think I do believe that if more of my entrepreneurs read Nietzsche, uh, I'd have to explain less to them. Um, you know, in terms of like just coaching wise, and uh, and I think there's just a lot, especially first time entrepreneurs. I think there's a lot to learn. Um, how much do you think reading? your book is about self-discovery versus a, um, a, a learning process. So I guess another way to ask that, you know, when I, when I read Nietzsche, a lot of it was like, oh, wow, I resonate with that. That resonates with me. Like, you know, like, but, it, but it helped me introspect in a way that I'd never done before and helped me understand myself. Um, so we're in that spectrum of like understanding versus learning do you think entrepreneurs benefit from, from your book? I, I like the dichotomy. I think it's a blend of both. And we set up the book on purpose so that one could move between those two. The book is called The, the Entrepreneur's Weekly Nietzsche. It's 52 Nietzsche quotes. Each quote is a chapter. It's broken up into five sections that are thematic. We start with the, you know, the classical translation of a Nietzsche quote. We then- You mean Walter Kaufmann? 
Kaufman is the uh, Kaufman's the source of some of them. They're all we 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 chose all open source translations. So we were very careful to make sure that we were doing things in a way that was sort of clean from a contemporary publishing perspective. We then do, in other words, so our 2021 or 2020, 2021 transliteration of the quote. It's not a translation, it's our, in other words, interpretation in common, common parlance, common English. We then write a two to three page essay. And each of these essays relate the quote to entrepreneurship. And then about two thirds of them are narrative, have a narrative that's an example, a few from us, but mostly from other entrepreneurs, but from a wide variety of entrepreneurs. We did not try to pick famous entrepreneurs who are extremely well known. We just picked a wide variety from our network to then give an example um, that they felt the quote related back to in their work. We didn't give them the narrative. We didn't give them the, the chapter in advance. We just gave them the quote. We also didn't try hard to edit their narratives. We wanted them to be more like blog posts in their words versus perfectly polished English. So it was accessible. So that's, you know, each of these 52 chapters might be five pages um, or, or less. And the, the reason for that is, our goal was to let them be sort of a chapter a week if you wanted. I mean, you could read the book cover to cover. You could dip into an individual chapter that caught your attention. And again, this tempo, like the original Nietzsche quote, our transliteration or our translation, we actually encourage people to read the Nietzsche quote second, read our translation first, and then go back and read the Nietzsche quote, and then read the essay, and then go read the Nietzsche quote again and then go read the narrative and read the Nietzsche quote again. So Krishna, to your point, like letting it stimulate and percolate the thoughts. That's on one end. At the other end, there's a lot of meat in our essays about things that are applicable to entrepreneurship. We're not trying to be Nietzsche scholars. We're also not trying to be deterministic about what you should do as an entrepreneur. So there are narratives that don't necessarily agree with what we wrote. And there's one narrative that's very meta by an entrepreneur named Tim, Tim, Tim Enwall, which said when he first read our, our, our essay, he disagreed with it. And then as he thought about it some more and read the Nietzsche quote again and thought about it some more and then thought about what it actually meant and how it really, and that's his, Right, that's his narrative with real examples. So we try to let it be both because, and you said it at the beginning of this, the richness of Nietzsche is you can read something, a short quote, one sentence, two sentences and go, wow. And then if you think about it some more, you go, wow, again. And then if you think about it some more, it might frustrate you a little bit or a lot. And then when you hear something that somebody else said about that quote and applied it in a way that you don't like, or that's offensive to you, you might go, wow, that's, that's no good. And it was part of the provocation of Nietzsche and part of why there's so much richness in it is because it does stimulate one to think, which is part of the point. And part of what his, I. I believe, again, not as being a Nietzsche scholar, but from my frame of reference, anyone who's being provocative is trying to either uh, sway people in a direction or provoke them to think in intellectual. And, you know, one of the famous lines about Nietzsche is that he- Entrepreneurs do the same thing, right? With their- All with their day long, every day. That's the essence of it. and. One of the great Nietzsche lines is that he philosophizes with a hammer. And if you think about entrepreneurs, many entrepreneurs, I don't have the right word, entrepreneur with a hammer, right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not subtle. Like you're trying to bash your way through something totally new against the backdrop of the constraints uh, and, the, and the restraints of what the, was- the, the will to power. Right, uh, as as uh, as Nietzsche would call it. Now, uh, I want to take a step back for a second. You know, 
in in the forward, you know, Reed Hoffman um, mentions how philosophy. Uh, many many great entrepreneurs are humanists as well, and um, and however, if I look at, for example, my generation, I'm not sure how many uh, you know people in their 20s and early 30s have read much philosophy or think of philosophy as an inspiration for entrepreneurship. Uh, and so I would love each of you maybe to, to comment briefly on, you know, how, how practical, wh why is philosophy important? Why is it practical for entrepreneurs today to, to adopt uh, and maybe particularly existentialist philosophy? And, and maybe Father Francisco, you can comment on this just more broadly. Why, why, is, why are these masters still relevant um, to people who want to do great things today. Rebels, uh, I guess, the, you know, at our firm at, at, at Remus, we, we, we are very keen on this rebel terminology uh, because that's the best way I can describe someone who says, I'm not, I just don't care about what other people think or say, and I'm going to be truly independent in how I think and act and how I understand myself and how I understand others. And I think that is something that Nietzsche would adopt very clearly. So, so, Brad, maybe you can start us off here. What, why is philosophy relevant? Well, I, I'd, I'd, love, uh, I'd love for Father Francisco to start us off um, because I just, I just gave a, 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 big, uh, a big dump. And I'll, I'll answer the question, but I'll answer at the end why I think philosophy is relevant to entrepreneurs. But Father, please, please give us a start from your frame of reference. Thank you. Well, first of all, bear in mind, as I said earlier, I am, um, I sort of represent an unreconstructed view of philosophy and particularly the ancients. So on the one hand, I totally get it why Stoicism would be of interest to venture capitalists. Um, Stoicism focuses particularly in ethics. And so uh, concerns itself with the questions of how we are meant to live our best life, first and foremost. But uh, what, what strikes me is, um, I have to say, peculiar, even stimulating about the interest that the two of you are showing in Nietzsche is that it appears, at least on the surface, to amount to um, what I think continental philosophy in general, and bear in mind, I am the enemy of continental philosophy, right? But what I think continental philosophy would find the complete subversion of Nietzsche, whose interests, um, though he expresses them rhetorically, very clearly lie in, uh, in metaphysics and in phenomenology. So to, uh, to, to use the term that Marx and Engels have adopted, um, we might say that a, a book of the kind that Mr. Feld has um, just produced co-modifies philosophical metaphysics, which is something, I mean, it's way more subversive than anything I was able to do in my classrooms in trying to inoculate, for example, poor Krishna against um, the, the, the hermeneutics of suspicion. So I'm, I'm almost delighted to hear what you're, you're saying about Nietzsche. I, I, I think, um, especially because it's the kind of thing that will give French philosophers conniption fits, um, we're, we're seeing um, a, a kind of um, co-option of Nietzschean concerns in the areas of phenomenology and, and metaphysics, or rather his denial of metaphysics, which is, you know, just like anti-rhetoric is rhetoric, so the denial of metaphysics is, um, is metaphysics. I, I think um, it, it's important to note that philosophy, both ancient and modern, is stimulating the deepest kind of systematic thinking. And if, um, if the venture capitalist is going to have any success whatsoever, he needs to be able to function at those levels. And the, the second thing that I think um, you know, is, is worth uh, pointing out, both with regard to the Stoics, especially the Roman Stoics, and, um, and Nietzsche himself, is that he both believed that philosophy had immensely practical applications, which is not generally an attitude that one finds in the academy. I mean, unless you consider 
cranking out endless um, you know, articles for peer reviewed journals that really nobody's reading to be impactive, um, I, I, I'd be um, surprised that there aren't at least some students of philosophy out there who would welcome an effort like this um, and, and find it intriguing. So yeah, what the heck, Mr. Feld, go for <laughs> it. <laughs> So I'll add on to that because I like the way uh, I like the way uh, it was set up. So we subtitled this book very deliberately, uh, and the subtitle is "A Book for Disruptors." And you know there are, there are a number of things that entrepreneurs do. And there's a lot of cliches in entrepreneurship, but essentially I think most entrepreneurs aspire to be disruptive, to create something uh, that is new and that disrupts the status quo and as such advances things forward in the creation of what they're doing. Um, the forward to the book was written by Reed Hoffman and, and Reed, uh, uh, Reed studied philosophy uh, when he got his master's degree, and I didn't have any idea. I've been friends with Reed for a while. I didn't have any idea whether he knew much about Nietzsche or not, or was a fan or not. And early on, I sent him a note that I was starting to work on this book, and I was just curious what his reaction was, knowing that his reaction would be probably either that's awesome or that's awful. Because my own experience is most people's reaction to Nietzsche is either that's awesome or that's awful. And um, Reed's was, that's awesome. It was very enthusiastic. Um, and we had a lot of back and forth on it. And I just wanna read two things from his forward because he wrote the forward. A lot of times when you, when you do a book and somebody writes a forward, they, they ask you to like give them bullet points or write a draft so that they can at least kind of get the measure of the book. Um, Reed did what one would hope someone does. He read, he asked for a draft of the book. He read the book and then he wrote a forward. And other than changing a couple of points of punctuation, we published this forward as is. It, it just land, it was so strong. Um, and the two quotes that I'm going to read, one is I'm going to start with a Nietzsche quote. And the other is I'm going to just read a paragraph that I think will relate back to what uh, Father, you just said a few minutes ago. The quote, the Nietzsche quote is from Twilight of the Idols. Uh, and what Reed writes is, in Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche exclaims, to live alone, you must be an animal or a god, says Aristotle. He left out the third case. You must be both a philosopher. Reed goes on to say the entrepreneur's version might go like this. Aristotle says that to envision a new product that changes the model, one must either be a mad person or a genius. Forgetting the third case, both an entrepreneur. On the, pre yeah. on, on the preceding page, and this is a read paragraph. And again, I wanna just read it because it, it links back to this notion of theory and practice. Reed says, one of my favorite expressions is, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. The implication, in practice, there are significant differences between theory and practice. Nevertheless, both are critically important. Theory-driven practice, where you improve your theory from practice, is the strongest approach. Philosophy teaches you how to think in general theories. Philosophy teaches you precision in thought and language. Philosophy teaches you how to construct a theory, test it for truth, and then evolve that theory. And so does entrepreneurship if you're doing it right. So I just give those two things. I realize reading it, reading it aloud versus reading it's a little hard to process. But the, the point of both of those is, as, as somebody who has been an entrepreneur, been involved in entrepreneurship my whole adult life, my experience is that most entrepreneurs think deeply about different aspects of what they're doing. Sometimes because they want to, oftentimes because they're forced to. As an entrepreneur who over time has spent more time thinking deeply about things because I want to or I choose to, wants a little fuzzy of a word, I choose to. 
And then through thinking deeply, I put that thinking into practice in the work I do. I think I've become a much better entrepreneur and investor, not just with what I do, but with how I work with other entrepreneurs and other investors. I don't follow a rule book. I don't follow a playbook that somebody gave me that says to be a good this, you must do this, and then you must do that, and then you must do this. But I also don't just make it up out of thin air. I take prompts from lots of things. And what I found is that some of the philosophical prompts, or that I should say prompts that come from philosophy, have been some of the richest prompts and, and the most powerful ones because of the lack of constraints. And it comes back to this notion of, you know, when it doesn't mean that you have to agree, it doesn't mean that you have to follow a path. It means that you start down a path and how you think about it then emerges into what you put into practice. And, you know, I'll end with, you know, I said earlier, I'll say it again, the goal with this book and my goal was not to be a Nietzsche scholar. If you gave, you know, if you, if you uh, put me in a master's level class on Nietzsche in a philosophy uh, a master's or a PhD and you gave me a test, I would fail the test. I would fail the test happily because that's not what the goal for me of this is. It's not to become somebody who, as father said earlier, writes these papers that nobody reads in other words, in order to get more citations. But instead I'm using it to help me in my current existence generate a deeper and, and clearer view of what's important to me and how I wanna do things and what I wanna do. And I think in the context of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs with scarce time, with time as a scarce resource should allocate more of that scarce resource continuously to thinking more deeply about what and how they want to do things outside of the day-to-day -day activity that they have. And, you know, reading Nietzsche quotes is a way to do that. Well, I would add to that, you know, again, coming back to our earlier dichotomy between um, understanding and learning, Right. I actually think that one of the most powerful things that I have found in my life uh, from reading philosophy is just I understand myself better. And I think what I have found in working with entrepreneurs over the past decade plus is that the entrepreneurs who understand themselves best are the ones who are able to not just create that disruption, but then scale a business. Um, because they understand their strengths and weaknesses, they understand how to fill them. Uh, and I think that's one of the real strengths of philosophy is that it forces you to confront who you are um, with relation, not just to yourself, but to the people around you, to the society around you. And in some ways, a company as it scales becomes a sort of mini society. Um, and you're forced to sort of confront many of the same dynamics that you might find in society at large. So to oh, me, that, yeah. I was going to give you a, I was going to give you a Nietzsche quote that fits to that. Give it. Uh, I don't know what chapter number this is. It's a chapter called Delight in Yourself. Have joy in the endeavor, people say. But in reality, it is joy in oneself by means of that endeavor. It's a little meta, Krishna, to what you said, which is the importance of knowing yourself. But think about the number of people who say how important as, as an entrepreneur it is to love what you do. And often people don't ask why. And it's sort of implied that, you know, well, of course it's your own to do with whatever, you know, there's like lots of implications, but why is it valuable as an entrepreneur to love what you do? And this quote is, they say, our interpretation is, they say you should love what you do, but this is really a way of loving yourself through what you do. And if you then apply that to this notion of understanding yourself, how can you possible, possibly love yourself through what you do if you don't understand yourself? And the linkage of those two things are important because to understand yourself, you also must love yourself, right? And, and you keep going and you say, well, I don't agree with that. Here's why I don't agree with that. But that's part of the fun of this 
And part of the fun of applying philosophy in the context of entrepreneurship is pull that apart. I can tell you unambiguously that an entrepreneur who is working on a business that they don't care about, working on a product they don't care about, or doing something that they don't care about is less likely to be successful than an entrepreneur who is working on a business they love, on a product <laughs> they love. You say, uh, they are obsessed about. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Let, let me switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, Father Francisco, maybe you, uh, you in, in your sort of day-to-day, you confront this as well, or probably have confronted this over COVID. But I know that Brad has also written a lot about mental health um, and, you know, sort of the challenges that entrepreneurs face, uh, you know, when trying to build a company, um, trying to scale it, try, you know, being rebellious against society is challenging for many reasons. So, you know, how do we think about some of you know, the Nietzschean philosophy as a crutch, uh, as a way to empower people who do face some of these challenges? Or conversely, do we think that it might drive people toward having, you know, sort of, sort of, it, it becomes a survival of the fittest and sort of the people who can't sort of live up to this idealized version of an overman or ubermatch, you know, sort of running, Like Nietzsche himself, you mean? Like Nietzsche himself, uh, sort of running. So, you know, it's, it's a dilemma I find a lot with entrepreneurs, um, you know, and it comes back to this knowing themselves and sort of confronting their strengths and weaknesses while trying to achieve the idealized version of a Mark Zuckerberg or a Reid Hoffman or, or, or whatever without really knowing the struggles that these have gone through themselves. So, yeah, yeah, I'm curious, sort of how, how do you how do you view this sort of empowering, you know, philosophical um, inquiry of existentialism broadly, which is saying, you know, and, and actually one of the biggest ways I think Nietzsche is misinterpreted is that I, I don't think he's a nihilist at all, right? I, I think he's, he's quite the opposite. He's, he's sort of saying, imprint yourself on the moment, you know, it, it's yours to win or lose. Um, but you can only really do that if you feel comfortable with where you're at mentally and, and, and sort of that balance, even for myself and my own entrepreneurial journey, I've often found that but to me, I come back to Nietzsche and I say, okay, I read one of these things and I'm like, oh, wow, I'm ready to go, right? This is my moment. I'm going to go imprint this. I don't care what challenge I have. Like, I can't be weak. Let's go attack this thing. In today's day and age, you know, you have, you know, Naomi Osaka sort of withdrawing from the French Open from, for mental, mental health issues. And, how, how, you know, you've got Prince Harry sort of on, on Oprah talking about how he's confronting these issues. It's becoming more open and open. Do we, how do we sort of merge philosophical thought of someone like Nietzsche with the mental health challenges an entrepreneur might have? Well, among the many prompts offered by philosophy that we benefit from really every day include the very distinction between practical reason okay. and theoretical reason that uh, Mr. Feld referred to just a few minutes ago. So uh, Aristotle refers to the first as phronesis, that is to say how we apply theory precisely in the field of ethics. That is to say, knowing what is the good way to live. And um, theoretical knowledge, of course, um, this is, this is Plato's special domain, um, suggests that there is above and beyond the practical grasp still something that is in principle knowable and worth striving for. So, um, I mean, at least insofar as Socrates is concerned, it's knowledge of the true, the good and the beautiful that heals our souls, that keeps us together under, um, uh, under the worst of circumstances. And I think, you know, despite his um, reputation as a rebel, Nietzsche recognizes this because doesn't Zarathustra, after all, begin his uh, journey into the transformation of society, firstly, by coming to know himself by recollecting in, um, in, in retreat, as it were, from the world and its concerns. Now, that 
I, I'm not suggesting that this is a practical model for entrepreneurship uh, or, or uh, you know, for the venture capitalist, what little I know about the world you guys live in, right? But I, I do know that there is no part of the human person that can be isolated for long from the good, the true, and the beautiful, and from the, the apprehension of these things inside the self. Otherwise, of course, we're going to go crazy. But is that not exactly the pathology of our age that um, we do, in fact, isolate ourselves for protracted periods from the true, the good, and the beautiful? Now, Nietzsche is already aware of this, and, and though he would not probably agree with my metaphysics, he nonetheless knows that entering the context of human relations and seizing the appropriate moment requires a, a kind of internal integration. And, and so, you know, these are, these are the perennial features, not just of existentialist philosophy, which bewails the crisis of that interior integration, but really of all philosophy, which sees it as the, the, the centerpiece, right? It says over the, the arch of the, the gateway leading into Delphi, know thyself, right? Absolutely. And, been there, seen it, yeah, absolutely. Brad, what do you have to say to this? Recently, I'd say in the last couple of years, um, the stigma associated with mental health in entrepreneurship has started to abate. Um, I had a very deep depressive episode in 2013 that lasted about six months. And I was very public about it. I'd had multiple depressive episodes as an adult. <clears throat> and this time uh, I decided I was writing daily on my blog. I just decided that if I wasn't open about what was going on, that I, I was uh, being disingenuous, sort of in an absolute sense. Um, it was during a time period where a couple of well-known entrepreneurs had committed suicide. And that was sort of a shock to the system. Like people were talking about it, but it was like so many other things. It, it didn't really change anything. It just sort of, you know, it was like a bump and then everybody sort of went back to the same place. And one of the things that I experienced from that period of time is probably a hundred plus uh, entrepreneurs and investors whose names people would recognize reached out to me. And in a lot of cases, I was the first person they'd ever talked to about their own struggles uh, with different issues surrounding mental health. So in this time frame, 2013, 2014, when I came out of this depressive episode, I decided that one of my goals was to uh, work to eliminate the stigma associated with mental health, uh, and specifically in the context of entrepreneurship. Um, so know that that's a foundational uh, thing for me, uh, from my own experience. And so I'll link it back to the book in that there's a chapter, it's the end of the section on free spirits uh, called Reflecting Your Light. And, and this is one actually where, um, interestingly, the, uh, the, the Nietzsche quote is not as well known, nor is it as chewy. And in some ways, it is even more profound. Uh, it says, seeking, seeing our light shining in the darkest hour of depression, sickness, and guilt, we are still glad to see others taking a light from us and making use of us as of the disk of the moon. By this roundabout route, we derive some light from our own illuminating facility faculty. Uh, in other words, when we are depressed and everything seems bleak, we can take some comfort in the way other people respond to us. Now, this is also for those, anyone that knows Nietzsche's personal history, this is very self-reflecting because this was one of his own struggles his, with, his, with his health, Absolutely. physical health, mental health, emotional health. Um, and so in some ways he's writing to himself However, it is also meta because he was not well known uh, in lots of areas while he was alive or well understood. His book certainly didn't sell well. Um, and so this sort of 
sort of aspirational reflection is very powerful. And for me, it's very helpful. And, and you know, we, the, the essay in this case, the narrative, sorry, is, my, is one from me. It's a very personal one about my own struggles and about when I was deeply depressed, how a few people continued to reflect my light in a way that gave me some solace and some comfort during this period that was a very difficult one for me. By the way, the, depression, the depressive episodes that I've had have not necessarily corresponded with failure or difficulties or cataclysmic events that directly impacted me. And in fact, if you looked at the one, the depressive episode I had in 2013, my marriage was great, my work was great. Um, many things, you know, I was in, living in a wonderful place, Boulder, Colorado, you know, I was loved by many, but I physiologically exhausted myself. And I had a series of triggering events that included a near-death experience, a bike accident that was a very scary one. And the physiological exhaustion was compounded by the work exhaustion, right? It was not just emotional exhaustion and physical exhaustion, but an inability for me to calibrate and constrain and recognize my own being of being totally exhausted, which was a chronic problem historically for me, which then coming out of that was something as I used some of my own reflection to know me better, fundamentally started to change some things. So it wouldn't, it might happen again in the future, but it wouldn't happen the same way. Um, one other sort of to end this, I have a joke and, and the joke when somebody says in, you know, entrepreneurship, you must learn from your mistakes. And there's a good Nietzsche quote somewhere, but I won't, I won't find the exact quote in the moments we have left. But I have a joke, which is, uh, um, I only make that mistake three more times. And, you know, the idea is that you don't learn from everything you do the first time you do something. A lot of mistakes you learn from or a lot of things that you learn about yourself take multiple times and seeing it from different angles. And I'll come back to this is where philosophy can be helpful as well. Because, you know, one, I certainly do make associations when I ponder some of these things that I wouldn't otherwise make. And when I make that association, I think, huh, I didn't actually realize that situation A and situation B were related by this thing. Situation A was a huge success. Situation B was a dismal failure, but they were related by the same abstract concept. I wonder what was going on that I could learn from that might prevent me from in the future from having the failure or increase the chance that I'll have the success. You know, yeah, there's that, that, an interesting moment in one of the Platonic epistles in which, if, if the epistle is authentic, and we, we have reason to believe it is, Plato asserts that he never wrote a word of philosophy. So if, if that's true, then what does he think those dialogues are? And, and it's, a, it's a question worth asking because um, uh, we know on account of his um, earlier philological treatises that Nietzsche contemplated the matter quite, um, uh, quite carefully. Could it be that those dialogues are really um, instruction in the method of inquiry? And if that's the case, then they look remarkably like the development of habits of mind, as well as habits of heart. And, you know, Socrates believed enough in those habits that he was willing to die rather than surrender them either for himself or for those um, with whom he discussed them. Uh, that, that's a tremendous commitment to a, a way of living philosophically that is meant, uh, yes, to stimulate a certain degree of um, uh, trouble. We, we, we call this the, the, the famous um, Platonic aporia, the impasse that, that seems to bring on a kind of crisis, but it's 
precisely because we learn how to live in and through the crisis that philosophy becomes something healing and transformative. Amazing. Well, we've just got a few minutes left here. Um, you know, from what I gather, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking, like I said, I'm going to buy a book for every member of our uh, portfolio, every CEO and founder of our portfolio and every member of our team. Uh, and uh, and I, I sort of, as I, as I give this to them, I'm curious, many of my founders are first time founders. And so coming back to your point, Brad, about, you know, you, sometimes you have to repeat mistakes multiple times. Well, I don't love uh, I don't love when our founders repeat mistakes, but you know, do you think that people will get more? How, I guess a different way to put this is, how do you think first-time entrepreneurs versus repeat entrepreneurs will glean uh, wisdom from your book differently? Um, you know, having lived one life versus multiple lives. I think um, the first-time entrepreneur. <clears throat> is going to have less of their own lived experience to relate, but it'll help them navigate the cliches and the stuff that people assert as truth uh, and the constraints that get put upon one's own thinking in the context of starting the company. I mean, I challenge any VC to say uh, they have never said you should to an entrepreneur. Every VC I've ever met, including me, has said you should. And I have many times. Right. And as an entrepreneur, when somebody says you should to you, a lot of entrepreneurs immediately think, well, I'm going to do the opposite of that. Um, or I'm going to go look for a better way or a different way, right? So sort of like understanding and having context around that is powerful for the first-time entrepreneur. For the experienced entrepreneur, um, I think you're going to relate, one would relate more of their own experiences, but at the same time, um, they're going to have sort of looser bonds to a lot of the you shoulds. And so it'll, they'll, they'll be more comfortable in some cases, I imagine traveling around uh, sort of in the miasma of the interesting different things. Um, let me give an example though that I think applies very broadly or make a statement, I guess, that applies broadly. I gave a, a graduation speech on Saturday. Um, I, was, I was invited to give graduation speech to one of the local uh, high schools here in Boulder. Um, it's a small private high school, about 80 people. I don't have kids and I don't have any relationship to the school. So I was flattered that they invited me. I know some people whose kids go there. And in fact, that turned out I knew a few who had kids graduating this year. And uh, I, I, do it almost, I do everything extemporaneously. I don't prepare a speech that I then read. I don't feel like that's the way my mind works and the way that I communicate. And so I spent some time thinking about in advance what I wanted the talk to be about. What would I tell these, you know, 17 and 18 year olds? And so I used the metaphor of getting in my DeLorean and time traveling back, um, you know, like, uh, they, like they did in Back to the Future to, my, to 1983 when I was a 17 year old. And I asking myself, what would I want to know? I would give that same metaphor to the first-time entrepreneur, if I time traveled back to when I was a first-time entrepreneur. And in some ways, it's the same that I would give to the high school graduates. I organized my entire talk around the notion of understanding your why. There's a very, there's a famous Nietzsche quote, which is, my translation is, if, if you know your why, you can get through any what. And that so lands with an entrepreneur because the work of creating a successful company is hard. It's full of ups and downs, all kinds of unexpected things, self-inflicted mistakes, exogenous factors you have no ability to influence or control, your own stuff, other people's stuff, sort of all the endless crazy that happens along the way. 
if you know your why, you can get through any what. It's kind of true for a 17 year old that's about to go off to college and, and essentially now start the process of separating from their parents and becoming their own adult. And my, I didn't know my why at all when I was 17. And I wasn't telling the kids here that they should learn their why. And that's the first thing they needed to learn. I emphasized to them that that was an important thing to put some energy into and to not just sort of blindly go forward with somebody else's why or the why that society tells you, but to do the work yourself to figure out what's important to you. And I think that's, you know, if, if, if I aim this now at first time entrepreneurs, I, that's what I think they'll get. And by the way, I know many, many experienced and many successful entrepreneurs who still don't know their why. And you see it every day in what they tweet and what they say and what they do. And so I'd encourage that as well. It's not that you should spend all of your time trying to find your why, but that in the entrepreneurial life to incorporate in as part of what you're doing. So you're constantly searching for it. And at 55, I don't know my why, uh, but I know lots of things about it. And I keep learning about it and I keep looking for it. So that's how I'd relate that. Again, back to that one Nietzsche quote. Well, well, when I was 17 is when uh, Father Francisco introduced me to Nietzsche. And, uh, and I remember uh, reading the Kaufman translations all summer. And that really helped me understand my why. Uh, and I started my, my firm you know, three years later when I was at MIT. Uh, but it was largely because when I was 17, I was aided in discovering kind of, to some extent, of course, it's a lifelong journey. But understanding kind of who I was better really through reading Nietzsche and, uh, and, and contemplating it and, and of course, you know, debating it. So I appreciate both of you making the time today. I know we're out of time, but I'm excited to sort of distribute your book widely. And thank you, Father Francisco, for coming on here and sharing some of your wisdom as well. You're welcome. And it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you all. <laughs> Hopefully we can all meet maybe in person sometime, somewhere and, uh, and discuss more philosophical nuggets of wisdom. Krishna, thank you for doing this. And, and Father Francisco, it's a delight to meet you. This was really fun. Nice and to meet you too. I look forward to, I know we're connected now by email, but I look forward to wherever that connection goes. Blessings to you all. Take care.